Hello, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome to Computer Sound and Music. Today we're going to continue what we started last talk with a little bit of discussion of the other thing that's important about music, which is besides notes having values, frequencies that they uh, hit, they also have rhythm and duration. And so we're going to talk about durations, note lengths, and that sort of thing, and get a little bit of the feel for the rhythmic structure of music. There's a lot of music notation in this, and I'm not going to dwell on it as much as the notes do, so expect this to go a little quickly. So let's get go ahead and get started with this. So. We're going to talk today a little bit about tempo, beats, and rhythm and what those are. We're going to talk about rhythms and duration of notes. And we're going to talk a little bit about time signatures, which is a way of organizing rhythms. And I think when we've covered all those things, you'll those of you who are musically already pretty skilled will be bored with most of this, I suspect. But for those of you who aren't, I think it'll give you some insight into how the music you've been listening to is really built and structured, and so that's kind of fun. So what is tempo? Well, that's the overall speed of the pace of the piece. So if you have some piece, then it's going to go either faster or slower, and that's an important thing that distinguishes the music. If you think about the songs you've heard in popular music, a lot of them have very similar tempos, but there are the songs with faster tempo and the songs with slower tempo, and it's one of those things where a very narrow range of tempos, tempos are usually measured in beats per minute, and a very narrow range of beats per minute tempos cover quite a lot of of range in terms of human perception. It's another place where the human perception is kind of non-linear. So here's an example of, you know, sort of some of the some of the terms used in classical music to describe tempos. Uh, you know, ranging from very, very slow, 20 beats per minute, nobody, very, very rare to see a piece like that. But typically, you're gonna start with sort of Largo as the lowest normal thing, 40 to 60 beats per minute. All these music terms are Italian because that's the language where they originated from, and you're gonna have to get used to that as well. You know, a moderate speed is sort of 100, eight to 120 beats per minute. These numbers aren't so precise as you say, but by the time you get to presto at 200 beats per minute, you're going really, really quick. And it's uh, challenging to listen to and challenging to play music that goes that fast. So that's tempo and I described the tempo in terms of beats per minute. What's a beat? Well, a beat is sort of a single fundamental unit of note duration. We sort of think of beats as sort of the seconds of music, just like when we describe time. You know, we might choose minutes or hours or weeks or microseconds as the thing that we're worrying about right now. But if you really think of it sort of atomically, a second is a thing. Well, in music, our seconds aren't all the same length. It depends on the tempo of the music, and it depends on how the... So, so one beat sort of is one pulse in the sound. Each one of these is a beat, and this you can tell the tempo because this is happening. And all of Western music is fundamentally built around this idea that there's a steady beat, a rhythmic thing happening. It's not just EDM, it's every kind of popular music. So there's that. What's rhythm? Well, rhythm is sort of playing games with the beat. If your music really is 
ba, 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 just one beat at a time. That's pretty, pretty boring music. And so we typically want to do more interesting things. We want to vary the actual rate, you know, times at which notes are played. So they happen between the beats. They happen off beat. They happen at the back beat, the saying goes. We want to be able to put multiple notes into a single beat and that's a real common kind of thing to do with music so you know that kind of thing you know now i've got some rhythm going boring rhythm but rhythm and you know like layla says in the notes rhythm isn't just a music thing rhythm is a thing in real life if i speak every word or every syllable in a monotonic pace even if i don't use a robot voice i still sound robotic because nobody talks like that my words are going to come at different times i'm going to use different pacing to emphasize different things and that's a rhythm just as much as rhythm is a thing in music so the that's the that's the story of tempo and rhythm uh i don't have a metronome with me so we're going to skip that part without a beat we don't have a sense of rhythm because it's hard to tell what's going on with the sounds the human ear is listening for that regular pulse that regular clock we hear it in the ticking of a literal mechanical clock we hear it in the backing noise that's made by a piece of heavy equipment as it backs up all these things even if they're a little off or irregular the washing machines thumping is gonna be a beat and we listen for them and we listen for them in that sort of range of beats per minute that is the normal range So once we've decided what the beat is, then we might choose to group beats together. And this is a system that's very, very old in Western music. And it's a system that's a little bit complicated to explain. What we're gonna do is we're gonna combine beats into something called measures. A measure here is gonna be sort of the minute to a beats second it's going to be the value that we group things up into to get a higher structure imposed on top of the basic rhythmic structure and you'll notice when i was clapping earlier i was going like that that's you'll notice there's a repeated pattern there and that repeated pattern sort of came in groups of four beats i broke up the second beat out of every four that's a really really common measure length the other one that's really common is three or six beats per measure that's those are really really common groupings and if you listen to popular music you'll almost always hear Four beats per measure is the most common. Three beats per measure, you'll hear around uh, six beats per measure. Hallelujah, uh, the Leonard Cohen song is a good example of a six beats per measure song. Very occasionally, you'll hear something else, march-like songs uh, are like that one by the pretenders are often in two beats per measure marches tend to be two beat songs sort of because there's sort of two steps to move your left foot and then your right foot but you'll hear other things one of my favorites is pink floyd's money which if you listen to it and count it really slowly you'll notice that there's a repeating pattern of seven notes and that's that's really unusual in mainstream popular music and it gives a really interesting sort of off-putting effect and it was chosen that way deliberately so anyway once we've decided how things are broken into measures we're going to use note durations to indicate how long we want the note to be held and the note can be held for a whole measure in which case we write this big 
oh, in a circle thing and call it a whole note, we write it, that we want it to be half a measure, in which case we, we, uh, we write it as a, uh, like this. I'm fibbing a little in, so music notation is so complicated. Really a half note is two beats, a quarter note is a single beat, which is really super annoying. An eighth note is half a beat. That was what I was doing there with that clapping. And a 16th note's a quarter beat. And beyond that, there are 32nd notes and 64th notes and sort of any power of two you care to name, but beyond 16th notes, really, they get harder and harder to play and again, harder and harder to listen to. And 64th notes are something that starts to be fast enough to start to sound like a its own tone. It's a repeating pattern. And so, you know, mostly you're gonna stop at 64th notes or 32nd notes and thing, um, if your tempo is anything reasonable. Notice that you can also have rests. A rest is instead of playing something, a note, you don't play a note. It's an indicated time where you're not supposed to be playing. And so if I'm clapping a piece with a rest in it, I might that's four beats per measure, I might write a half note followed by a half rest, and that would sound like And that's, uh, that's its own thing. You can have quarter rests and eighth rests and sixteenth rests, and we're gonna glue notes and rests together essentially to make measures that are four beats long. Four four is, you know, four beats per measure, each beat a quarter note, is the sort of common time and it's named that for a reason it's named that because so much music is written with this time signature and it's what in western music we come to expect where our ear is surprised if we if we get uh something other than common time as our time not very surprised if it's three four but or six eight but there you go so the four is uh four beats per measure the four on top the four on the bottom is how long is the note that gets the beat and that typically is a quarter note or an eighth note so so we'll talk about that more in a bit so a quarter note is sort of a normally one beat that's normally the thing in common time we'll pay a quarter note and you know, we'll sort of think of, for these things, we'll think of sort of quarter note beats for now because it's so commonly the case. A half note's two beats, a whole note's four beats, and so two half notes fit into a whole note or a half note and a half rest or a half rest and a half note. The eighth note, and you'll notice all these notations are like, sort of insanely confusing. What's the stem there for? It's there because otherwise it's really hard to see the note on the staff. Your eye can follow it down to the actual note. The filled in one is a quarter note. The not filled in one's a half note. And then a whole note is gonna be not filled in and we give up the stem because typically the whole note is written so big and is sort of all by itself on the staff, it's not hard for your eye to find it. And so that distinguishes it from a half note. When we go the other way, when we start going down the, down the powers of two into the negative ones, well, an eighth note has this little flag on it. Or if you have two eighth notes next to each other, it's common instead of the little flags, which would be kind of noisy and confusing to just stick a bar between them to say this is two eighth notes. And so flag, single flag notes are eighth notes and they go half a beat. And then we have the 16th notes, which go a quarter beat. They have two flags or two bars. And guess what 32nd notes are? Well, there's three flags or three bars and so forth. So that's how that all works. That then is going to be a 16th, two sixteenth notes, which are tied together by the um, by the two bars on the left, 
and then an eighth note on the right which is you know tied to the other sixteenths and so this whole thing is two sixteenths plus one eighth so that's one quarter that's a one quarter note length thing consisting of three notes and it would be played something like um and uh and that's the way that goes generally group notes by beat this makes it easier on the reader and that's absolutely right so this is the way you would normally write that pattern you wouldn't put little flags you wouldn't break things up you wouldn't generally write other stuff with it it just makes it a lot easier to read if you do that so there's that and now let's keep going here we also have triplets we don't really need to talk that much about triplets but the idea here is that if i put a three over some notes and bar them together it can be mean that you play in sort of in threes so if i if i uh, if i'm going uh, no, I, can, I can hardly even do it because i'm bad at rhythm but um you know the idea here is that we'll play three notes in a space that's in one beat or in you know you can have whole note triplets half note triplets eighth note triplets whatever you want to have and like Layla points out here these terms are really sort of math right these things sort of add up we've got these fractions they add up you figure out what the relations between them are and off you go doing this stuff now of course the cool thing about having a computer to do this is if I write down a piece of music in some, with some particular rhythmic structure, I get exactly what I asked for. If, if I tell the computer to play 120 beats per minute and play this rhythmic pattern, that's exactly when things are going to start and end, ideally, if your software isn't broken. And that sounds fantastic, but the real truth of the matter is that it sounds very, very leaden. Uh, there's a very famous player whose name is escaping me of the works of Scott Joplin of Ragtime Works, who is renowned for his metronome-like precision. And to me, it takes all the fun out of ragtime. It is the way ragtime is supposed to be played, is relatively slowly and with perfect precision on every note. But it, it, to me, it loses the soul of it. What, you know, people fell in love with ragtime in the modern era, partly because of uh, the entertainer from The Sting. And the if you listen to that performance of Scott Joplin's The Entertainer, it's just fantastically expressive. And that expressiveness would be lost if you played it the way it was supposed to be played. And it's lost when a computer plays it. I've heard a lot of keyboard players play The Entertainer over the years. And it's because it's something of a rite of passage for a certain kind of piano player. Stride piano is hard. And I've always enjoyed the performances, even when they're stumbly. I've heard a lot of computers play it over the years because there's MIDI files lying around and I've never been excited by one. So here's some more music notation to mess around with stuff. If you, if you want to have sort of a beat and a half, you could write it as a quarter note tied to an eighth note but that's pretty distracting for such a simple concept. And so you can dot a note to get half again its length. Again, you know, if you're not comfortable with music notation, don't worry about this, but it's a thing you can do. The last thing we should talk about is sort of time signatures. This is the thing we've been hinting around all along, which is that we're gonna group notes up, beats up into measures. And the time signature in a piece of music is the thing that says, how, how those groups are going to be formed. So if I write 4-4 four, four, there again, I mean that I've got quarter notes, that's the number on the bottom, and I'm going to have four of them per measure. So the beat's going to be a quarter note, and I'm going to have four beats per measure. And if I write 3 over 1, that means that the division is the whole note, and I'm going to have three of them per measure i think that's a typo i think that's supposed to be three four i had i 
Layla is way more knowledgeable at music than I have, but I've never, literally never seen in my entire musical career a piece written in 3-1 time. There's a lot of pieces written in 3-4. Uh, 6-8 is interesting because the beat now is going to be an eighth note instead of an a quarter note. Why would I do that? Well, it has to do with where you place the accents. It turns out that one of the things that distinguishes a beat typically a measure typically its beats is that we accent sort of by default certain ones what does accent mean basically dynamics basically make it louder so if i'm playing in 4/4 i typically will have a strong initial accent on 1 and a lighter accent on 3 i'll go didn't do that very well like that um and if i'm playing in 6/3/4 i'll go like that if i'm playing in six eight it'll be like four four there'll be a strong accent in the first after the first three and a weaker accent after the second three and when we talk about harmonic structure you'll see another reason why you might choose different time signatures like this and that has to do with where we place the chords and chord changes the very briefly seven eights like i say pink floyd's money is one two three five six seven one two three four five six seven like that that's that's seven eighth time and it's a really interesting time these are um this is a, this C here is a common time symbol and it just stands for four four. So that's the you know standard grouping stuff and we just stick that right on the staff to say hey this is what we're doing. Uh, there's a three four song over the river and through the woods. There's a, some arpeggios in six eight time. And so yeah the the groupings here have to do with the time signature, right? I've got four beats in this measure, so I can have four quarter notes, I can have two half notes, I can have a whole note, I can glue this together like this, which is sort of the rhythm I've been clapping along, and all of those things sort of set the pulse of the music. So, when you listen, you're gonna hear those pulses as sort of a different thing. I think there's a missing thing right here. No, that's two, two times, so I don't know. Um, and if you've ever wondered what an orchestra conductor does, this is their principal job is to make sure that you can that the orchestra is not just playing the notes, which everybody in a real orchestra is really gonna play the right notes basically all the time. Their job is more to make sure that the expression's right. They're listening for where are you putting the accents, are things moving smoothly, or is the phrasing right, etc. And that's that's their big job. So this says next time, but that's not true. Next time we're going to talk about intonation and pitch, which is a topic I put off until later. But after that, we'll talk about rhythms, pulse, time signature, and that stuff, and playing around with it with the computer. So that's really the next to last bit of the sort of whirlwind tour of music theory without much reference to computers. Next time, join me and we'll take a look at harmony and its role in music, sorry, at intonation and its role in music and, t and uh, temperament. And then after that, we'll talk about harmony and chords. And when we've talked about those things, we will have ourselves pretty well covered for the music we, we stuff we need. And we'll also have looked a little bit already at sort of music analysis and generation as opposed to sound analysis and generation. So stay safe out there. Thanks for listening, and I will talk to you again soon.